All right. Okay, well, if you have a Bible, um, open it to Ephesians chapter 3. And in keeping with uh, the theme this year for the first Sunday of the month, uh, preaching on prayer, we're going to be looking in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verses 14 to 19. And uh, this is one of two of Paul's prayers for the church in Ephesus. And you know, and you know we're, we're looking at these prayers from the Bible because one of the best ways to learn how to pray is to study, the, uh, study really and imitate the prayers of the Bible uh, because the Bible is the Word of God. And though this particular prayer we're going to look at this morning uh, was directed toward the Ephesian church, because Paul wrote it under divine inspiration, it not only applies to Ephesus, but to all the church at all times throughout history. And so, looking with me at Ephesians 3, look at verse 14 and 15. Paul the Apostle said, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So, Paul began his prayer by acknowledging God the Father. And this, of course, is how Jesus taught us to pray. Uh, in Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus said to the disciples, In this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And thus our prayers should be addressed to God the Father. And the reason why, you might ask, well, because as Paul said here in verse 15, it's from him that the whole family in heaven and earth derives its name. Referring to believers of every age. Um, of those who are in heaven and those who are still on the earth. And thus, God the Father is the source of all things. And he was the divine architect and planner of our salvation. Jesus said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And you find Jesus saying in John's gospel over and over again that it was God the Father who sent him. Uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, in John chapter 5 verse 30, Jesus said this, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Um, John chapter 6, verse 38. Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And then John chapter 7, verse 16. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. And that, these are three instances of 38 separate occasions that recorded in John's gospel that we find Jesus referring to the fathers sending him. And in, I'll just quote to you from um, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, in his prophecy concerning the things that Christ would suffer. Um, in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, listen to this. Isaiah said, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, Christ. He has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. Who bruised him? The Father. God the Father sent his Son to the cross. Ultimately, it was the will of God the Father that Jesus go to the cross and be bruised there, suffer and die. Why? For us. Isaiah went on in that prophecy to say he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. But whose plan was this? The Father? And thus God the Father is the source and head over all things, and this is why Paul directed his prayer to him, and we should do also. Now, Paul also said here in Ephesians 3.14 uh, that he bowed his knees to the Father in heaven in prayer. Now, in saying that, was Paul prescribing a required posture in prayer? 
No, um, I don't believe so. And the scripture bears witness to the fact that God's people have prayed in many different postures and have been heard by God. Uh, Abraham, when he was interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, he did so while standing before the Lord. You can read, read that in Genesis 18:22. Uh, King David, in 1 Chronicles 7.16, we read, sat before the Lord uh, as he prayed concerning God's promise to him that God was going to build him a house and raise up the Messiah to come from his line. Uh, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, we read that Jesus fell on his face as he prayed to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so, it's not so much the physical posture as the posture of the heart. That God is looking at. Do you know that? You know. And if your heart's not in it, you're not praying. <laughs> you might be on your knees. You might be on your face. But if your heart's not in it, you're not praying. Posture's not what counts. The attitude of the heart. Now, if that be so, you might ask, why then did Paul even mention the physical posture here in which he prayed? Bowing his knees to the Father. Well, I believe he did so purely out of a desire to express his deep reverence for the triune God. Uh, Paul was simply in awe of the greatness of the Lord, and he expressed that by getting down on his knees. It was an act of worship as he prayed for the Ephesians. But he wasn't saying that every prayer ever offered had to be like that. But in this particular place... He got on his knees. Now, you'll notice in verse 14 here, um, if you're reading out of the New King James Version, like I am, uh, that it reads, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, other English translations, if you're reading out of the NIV or the NASB or the ESV and so forth, they leave out the phrase at the end there in verse 14, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason for that is due to a difference of opinion uh, amongst the, uh, the translators of the Greek manuscripts. But either way, it doesn't affect the meaning of uh, this text. But what I would like to point out is that in almost every other place in the New Testament where the Father is mentioned, he is always referred to as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason for that is to stress the equality that exists between God the Father and God the Son. Uh, as Jesus is God's only begotten Son from all of eternity. You know, Jesus didn't come into existence when he was born um, in Bethlehem. He always existed. In fact, John said in John 1.1, 1, 1, referring to Christ, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John went on to say how all things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Jesus is God's only begotten Son. And it's only through faith in Jesus that anyone has the right to call God Father. Did you know that? Let me quote to you again. John chapter 1, verse 12. We read this concerning Christ. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Only those who have received Christ for who he truly is, both God and man, are children of God. That's what the Bible says. And that's an important truth to understand because there are those who would seek to teach the universal fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man and claim that we are all children of God, but that is not so. Um, let me quote to you from John MacArthur, I like what he had to say about this. He said, Scripture clearly teaches two spiritual fatherhoods, God's and Satan's. God is the heavenly father of those who trust in him, and Satan is the spiritual father of those who do not. Now that might shock some of you to hear. Wait a minute. What are you saying? Well, according to the Bible, if Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, then God's not your father. The devil is. And you know, Jesus taught this very thing. In fact, in John chapter 8, when he was having a discussion with the Jews, uh, who made the claim that God was their father based on their physical relationship to Abraham. They were Abraham's 
descendants. And so they were claiming God is our Father. But Jesus said to them, and if you have your Bible, just turn for a moment to John 8. I want you to listen to this conversation that Jesus had with them. It's John chapter 8, uh, beginning in verse 37. John 8, verse 37, and we'll read through verse 44. Jesus speaking said, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. He's talking to the Jews. They answered and said to him, verse 39, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. Verse 41, listen to what he said. You do the deeds of your father. Now they get upset. Here's a cheap shot. Then they said to him, we are not born of fornication. We have one father, God. That was directed to him. Because they didn't believe in the virgin birth. But look what Jesus said, verse 42. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Notice how he said that again. Verse 43. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. Here's why. Verse 44. You are of your father the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar the father of it. So Jesus clearly taught something here that's important that we grasp. As he said to them, if God was your father like you're claiming, then you would love me <laughs> because I am his son. Jesus said, I proceeded forth and came from God. Um, in John 1.18, we read this, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. The exact representation of his nature and being. And thus, to reject Christ is to reject the Father. As you cannot have one without the other. And... According to Jesus, if his word has no place in your heart, it's because Satan is your father. And you are under his sway. Um, he is holding you and keeping you from believing in Jesus Christ and from becoming a child of God. That's what the devil does. He holds the world in unbelief. Paul said that he called him the God of this age and that he blinds the minds of those who don't believe, lest they should um, see the light of the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus. And so, Jesus clearly taught that. Let me just give you one more verse to solidify this truth from Scripture concerning the equality between the Father and the Son. And you can turn back to Ephesians 3. In, in John 5, verse 22 and 23, Jesus said this, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the, honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Did you hear that? The inseparability of the Father and the Son. You know, the, the, the scripture tells us God is one God manifests what? In three persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They are all equally God, yet distinct persons. It's a mystery. It's a glorious mystery. You know? But that's why I think, anyway, that's a long way of going around to tell you why I think the New King James translators probably got it right here in Ephesians 3.14, calling, as um, they said, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think that was probably correct. 
All right, verse 16 here in Ephesians 3, Paul moved um, to his petition, his prayer, his request for the church in Ephesus. And he prayed this, look at verse 16, that he, the Father, would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Paul's first petition to the Father for the church was for spiritual strength. And I want you to notice, for the inner man. Did you hear that? The inner man, the inner person. And oh, how we need to be strengthened with might. And I love that word, might. It it's comes from dynamis, and the, the, the dynamite, power, right? A power from God in the inner man. Um, oh, how we need to be strengthened with might, as Paul prayed here, through God's spirit in our inner man. Um, you know, the, the daily fight of faith and trust and obedience to God that we are in as Christians is a fight that is fought and won in the inner man. Uh, and if we fail to tend to our inner man and build ourselves up in our most holy faith uh, through daily Bible reading, uh, prayer, and seeking of the Lord, then we will lose the fight before we've even begun. Uh, because the Christian life cannot be lived in the resources of our fallen human flesh and strength. Did you know that? Uh, Zechariah 4.6. Let me quote to you here in the, from the Old Testament. Zechariah 4.6 says this. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel was the governor of Judah. And he was faced with the enormous task in that point in history of rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem that was torn down by the Babylonians after the Jews uh, returned from their captivity there. And there was a lot of opposition and difficulty involved with the rebuilding of the temple. But the word of the Lord came to Zerubbabel telling him how it would all be accomplished. As God said to Zerubbabel, and here's the rest of Zechariah 4.6, uh, God said this, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit says the Lord of hosts. In other words, Zerubbabel, I am going to accomplish this through you by my spirit. It will happen not in your strength, but in mine, says the Lord. And you know, the same thing holds true for us in following Christ in this world and in living the Christian life. We cannot do it in our own strength. You know, Isaiah the prophet, uh, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 30, said this, Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Even the youths. You know, human nature and human resource, even at its height and at its peak, is not sufficient. Uh, human nature, even before the fall and before being tainted by sin, couldn't get the job done. As Adam and Eve, in a state of innocence in paradise, what did they do? They sinned. And they fell. And so, our greatest need after receiving Christ and the forgiveness of our sins through Him and through His shed blood and atoning sacrifice on the cross is for spiritual strength in the inner man. And thus, Paul began his prayer for the church there, asking the Father, here in verse 16, that he according to the riches of his glory. Now what a statement is that? Okay. The riches of his glory would strengthen them with might, or with power, through his spirit in the inner man. And what a request made here by Paul on their behalf. As he called upon God Almighty to strengthen the believers in Ephesus, Notice, again, and I, this can't be said enough or emphasized enough, according to the riches of his own glory. Or, in other words, from his own limitless, inexhaustible, and infinite supply of strength and grace. God's own resources. You know, Think of that. And you know, there's no better way to pray for yourself or for fellow believers than that. 
that God would strengthen you. Say, Father God, here I come to you again today. Lord, would you strengthen me with might through your spirit in my inner man today? Pray that for yourself. Pray that for fellow believers. Pray that for me. Because we need strength. We need strength. Without him, we can do nothing. This is why prayer is so key and so important. Amen. You know, a prayerless life is a powerless life. You know? And, you know, and God wants us to pray like this. <laughs> You know, too often our prayers are far too small-minded. You know, as we come to God thinking, oh God, just throw, could you just throw a crumb or two my way today? You know, thinking, you know, or can you just help me get through the day or whatever when God wants to pour forth the riches of his own glory and grace upon us through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know. Now, a couple of reasons why I think our prayers are, are often, and you'll have to excuse my, the expression, puny, <laughs> is because, number one, uh, we fail to grasp the greatness of the triune God on whom we are calling. And then number two, I'd say, there's a lack of faith in his willingness to help us and to show himself strong on our behalf, you know. Again, let me quote to you uh, from Isaiah. I love these verses. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 to 31. The prophet declared this to the Israelites who really should have known better. He said, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. <laughs> God doesn't get tired. Listen to this. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Amen. And then Isaiah said, even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The endless supply of the riches of his own Glory through Jesus Christ, available to any and all who will come. You know, this is like a, you know, we liken it today to the richest man in the world. I don't even know who it is. I don't know if it's Bill Gates or <clears throat> one of those guys. <clears throat> he sends you a letter in the mail and he says, I want to give to you from my own resources, you know. Not just five bucks, but, but come on over and I've got a billion for you. I've got, you know, five million or whatever it is. You'd be like, wow, right? That's like what God is saying here. His own glory. You know, God desires that we should live not a meager Christian experience, just getting by, you know, but rather from the overflowing, never-ending, eternal supply of the riches of his own glory. You know how great God is? He spoke the world into, into existence with a word. Let there be light. There was light. You know how great God is? You, know? you, know, you remember Abraham was, and Sarah had the promise from God that they were going to have a son, but big problem. Abraham was about 90 and so was Sarah, and she was past the age of childbearing, and her womb was, she was barren her whole life, but God said, you're going to have a son. And, but God tested the faith, their faith in that promise. And he let years and years go by until they got to around the age 90. And all hope, uh, naturally speaking, was gone. But the Lord went to visit Abraham one day and reminded him of the promise. Your wife's going to have a son. But Sarah laughed. And then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? And then he asked her this question. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Too many times, it's our own lack of faith that holds us back from all that God has for our lives. And you know, if we're honest, I think far too often we are content with much less than what God would have us to know and experience in Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life 
and that more abundantly. Amen. You know, God wants you to experience the riches of his own glory, strengthened with might through his spirit in your inner man. Oh, what a prayer this is from Paul. We need to pray like this. You know, we need to pray like this. There's great power in these prayers. All right, we look at verse 17. Paul went on in his petition, and this is an important connecting dot here. Um, and he said this in the first half of the verse. He said, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, I just want to point something out before I go any further. Notice the Trinity in these verses. Paul's praying to the Father. He's asking that the Father would grant through his Spirit. And here we have Christ, the Son. The three in one. You find it all over. Amen. God is a trinity. But here we see the result or the purpose of being strengthened with might in our inner man by God's spirit. As Paul prayed here in verse 16, the reason why is so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. Did you get that? Why am I asking God to strengthen me and to give me strength in my inner man. It's so that Christ can dwell inside my heart through faith. And the idea here is of Christ being at home and settling down in our hearts. You know, there was a little booklet you may have read called uh, My Heart, Christ's Home. And you think of a home, right? You go home and you're comfortable there. You should, well, hopefully you are. Sometimes we're not, but you can, you can kind of let your hair down, right? You can go inside, you can throw your bag in the corner, kick off your shoes, go sit on the couch, and close the door and close it off to the outside world. Take a rest. It's the same idea here with Christ inhabiting our hearts, that he would be able to settle down there. No resistance. But we resist him because we're sinners. Right? We have a sin nature. And so we need the Holy Spirit to do the work in our hearts so that that resistance might come down and that Christ might be enthroned. Amen. And that's what Paul's praying for here. That we could be strengthened with might through God's Spirit in our inner man so that Christ might make his home in our hearts. Amen. That's why we need to be strengthened. Because we can't do it on our own. Because I can't obey God on my own. I'm a sinner. Wretched man, Paul said in Romans 7, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? You know, every Christian knows the grief and the pain of the battle against sin, the battle against temptation, the battle against failure, right? God knows, though. And that's why he wants to strengthen you according to the riches of his own glory with might. In your inner man. And that's what Paul was asking for. On behalf of the church in Ephesus. Now Paul went on in the second half of verse 17. And we'll read through verse 19 and close here. Paul said that you being rooted and grounded in love. Verse 18. May be able to comprehend with all the saints. What is the width and length and depth and height? To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge? <laughs> what are you talking about here? How great is his love? According to Paul, it passes knowledge. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This is an incredible prayer. Incredible prayer. You know, as your life comes more and more into line with Christ, the result will be a, gra a greater measure of his love and grace Amen. that you will know and experience. And Paul said, this is to take place, notice, with all saints. You know, the Christian life was not meant to be lived alone. And this is one of the problems that COVID has brought to us. Some people are still trying to live it alone. Just tuning in online at home, watching church services, and then going about their, their life. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. The Bible says we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. There's something special about just coming together with fellow Christians 
in hearing God's word. There's a power in it. Um, And it's meant to be lived together, as Paul said, with all the saints. You know, we're one body in Jesus Christ, each members. And Paul here spoke of being filled with all the fullness of God. How glorious is that? You know, people are so empty today. Because this world has nothing to offer. You know, it's a dead end. But Jesus has life. He said, I have come that you might have life, and that more abundantly. Love, grace, mercy. And you know, he went to the cross to prove it. That's the thing I love about Jesus. He's not just talk. (laughs) He's all action, too. He didn't just tell you he loved you. (laughs) He showed you by going to that cross taking your place, bearing our shame, taking our sins so that we might have life. And more abundant life. God help us not to live like paupers, you know. You know, you've, if, I don't know if you've read those stories about, I can't remember who specifically it was, but these, this old woman or these old women who had millions, they lived like they were, you know, basically on the streets never repair anything in their homes, Um, ate just, you know, food that wasn't very good, were stingy and all the rest of it, and then they die, and then then their relatives come to find out they had like five million bucks in the bank, you know. There's, There's been accounts like that, people like that, and God help us not to be like that spiritually. (laughs) Walking around miserable, like we're so poor, we're so destitute, when here, we read of the riches of his own glory through Jesus Christ. The resources of his own Holy Spirit for our inner man. And Christ wants to dwell in your heart by faith. Empower you. Fill you with his love. You know, Jesus said, and I'll close here, in John 7, verse 37 to 39, he said, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Thirsty. Jesus is the answer. God the Father is the source. The Spirit of God will come and fill your heart. But it's through faith in Him. You have to believe in Him. You have to give your life to Him. You have to open your heart to Him. And I would encourage you to do that. And pray like this. (laughs) There's power in that prayer. With that shall we pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and for your truth, Lord. We thank you for the life-giving power of your word, your spirit, Lord, the resources you have promised to us, Lord, that we don't have to live this meager existence, Lord. But as you said, Lord, you've come that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly, Lord. And Lord, you want to strengthen us according to your own glory, Lord, your own riches, your own power. And I pray you would do that in our hearts, Lord. Lord, if for those of us who are struggling, maybe we've been resisting you in certain ways in our life. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us by your spirit in our inner man, that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, Lord, that you might take your place on the throne of our hearts and be home there. And that we might know more of your love, more of your power, And we ask this in your precious name, Jesus.